Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another lesson and episode of our little series on conflict of laws from a German point of view. Today, I would like to talk to you a little about some general principles, actually, the methodology of conflict of laws, as most courts and judges worldwide would apply that and would handle international cases. So you already know, or you might already know about that system of steps we have to go through to figure out which law in an international lawsuit to be applied. If you don't, um, I would suggest, I'll have a very brief introduction in a couple of minutes, but if you don't really know what we're talking about when we talk about the German Article 3, and don't worry about the EGBGB, it's just the German abbreviation for the introductory act to the German Civil Code, and these letters mean Einführungsgesetz zum Bürgerlichen Gesetzbuch. Most of you will think that's a pretty funny name for a law, but it's a German law and it's a German name, so we have to live with that. So uh, we have more information about that in the other lessons and below our little movie over here, you can find the URLs, you can find the links for that. So you, if you're interested, you're really interested, have a look at that and see what that actually means. Today, we are more or less gonna be focusing on the other steps we need to figure out uh, which laws can be applied in an, in, a, in an international lawsuit, starting with a qualification, and then a strange thing, which is called Envoi. It's a French name, Envoi. And I'll tell you a little why they, these names are French. It's about the same with the very last one down there, the Ordre Public, and it's all French names. Well, you might be interested and excited now. Wow, why is it like that on English, which is the major uh, international language, meanwhile? Good. To make things a little easier for you, I suggest that we have two example cases, so it's always a little nicer and a little more general, more to be hands-on, like if you have a case study you can work on. And these are our two cases, okay? So uh, you might be already used to it. Um, you stop the presentation for a while now and, and read the two cases. Basically, the, the best thing would be to read the first case first and then afterwards the second one, but just read the two so you know what we are uh, talking about. So I'd give you the time for that. All right. What we always have to do, and we, we need that, we have to have an assumption, and the assumption is it's always a German court which is going to be applying, uh, which is going to be deciding, sorry for that. Um, in another lesson, we might talk about that choice of courts and forum shopping, as they call it. But for the time being, we, we simply assume it's a German court. And the German court will always start with that thing, say, Woo, this is an international case. And if it's an international case, I have to apply Article 3 of that introductory act to the German civil code. Okay, Even though we already looked at it, I give you... Uh, the text of that, that's a pretty long one. It's kind of complicated to apply it in the one or the other version. You might read it now and, and have a close look at it. But in our case, it's pretty obvious that we can say, yes, it's an international uh, case. It obviously is because we have a German person and we have an Australian person and they have their accident in, uh, in Thailand. So their minimum three international law systems involved in the case and we have to decide which is going to be applied. And the first step after having applied Article 3 of the German Introductory Act, that is that qualification question, okay? What type of claim is it? Because as long as we don't know which type of claim that is, we will not be able to find out which laws to be applied or which laws we will have to apply in a specific case. That means we have to look at the case a little more diligently now, a little more differentiated, that's easier to say, and um, see what, what the background of that is. What type of uh, claim could that be? And one of the prerequisites is you, you gotta know what types of claims exist, otherwise you cannot decide which uh, type of claim that could be, okay? So let's have a look at our 
classification, qualification of claims, and that's the same list as always. We have contractual claims, they are based on contracts. Wow, that's uh, good information looking at the first word, contractual and that, which are based on declarations of intention. It's more or less what the persons the people want to do. Definitely our two persons over here did not have a contract on an accident or having an accident or something like that. So it's not really applicable, okay? Claims based on rights in REM, that's property law, that's uh, some kind of very absolutely protected law, such as patents, licenses and that. But it's all this security uh, rights and security laws we have, but it's which are focusing on a thing, some kind of value. But it's not a, the same over here, it's simply an accident, which is an accident. So we have to go to the statutory claims. And looking at the statutory claims on the screen now, you can see, aha, we have law of torts. Now, law of torts means there is something or something illegal happened and somebody suffered a damage from that. So that might be a good thing to look at for our case because normally when uh, accidents occur, somebody violated some kind of a traffic law, a traffic rule, and that led to these tragic consequences of having some kind of an accident, somebody getting injured, cars and motorcycles, bicycles are damaged, and sometimes even houses and stuff like that. So that might be our area, okay? Let's move on to the case. And uh, when we look at the case, we can say, well, it's an accident. Now we did the qualification from a legal point of view. If somebody wants compensation of damages because of an accident, that is the part we would qualify over here in Germany in most parts of the world as law of torts. Okay, now we got to figure out where is the regulation, where is the law telling us if we have an international law of torts case, which laws shall we apply? And as you might have seen before, we have that for the German courts and for the European Union area in the Rome II regulation of the European Union. If you don't have it right now, you better get a copy of that. But as a, a service uh, from our side, the next slide will show you the text. But if you're really interested, you should get your own copy and see what's actually in there. It has a couple of uh, something like 80, 90, maybe 100 articles. Some I don't remember. But um, so you can have a look at that yourself. And you might wonder and you might try to think, would I have found the correct article if I was confronted with that type of case? Uh, you don't have to look very far because already at the first articles over there, we have Article 4. And Article 4 is the article for the law of torts. And it says which laws can be applied in an international law of torts case. So we will have, a, have to have a look at Article 4. Bah -bah, and there's a general rule. So the general rule, if uh, lawyers talk about a general rule, it normally means that you have a lot of exemptions from that. And <laughs> yes, yes, you're right. Unfortunately, there are more uh, chapters of Article 4, and they have more differentiated uh, rules on that. But let, let's stick with the general rule first, just to explain what that actually means, the qualification of a claim. And we see that over here, if it's a pretty common law, and even in the times before we had a rule like that in Europe or in Germany, uh, the jurisdiction would have applied the same rules. And that's just a wise thing to do. It's just very reasonable. Let's read it together. Unless otherwise provided for in this regulation, the, unless otherwise provided for in this regulation, the law applicable to a non-contractual obligation arising out of a tort or delict shall be the law of the country in which the damage, damage occurs. Okay, let, let, let's stay with that and maybe you... you find very big interest in what we do over here and they go, oh, well, it's very interesting. So you do a, little more, do a little more research about all the other types, but now for the general rule, that's sufficient for us. And we will come back to our case. Now, we would have to look at the case and this is what we already figured out. We, we said it's an accident 
an accident has to be qualified from a legal point of view as law of torts. Law of torts and the rules about conflict of laws for law of torts is to be found in Rome 2 regulation of the European Union. Over there in Article 4, first paragraph. And since that accident occurred in Thailand, well, this case will follow the Thai rules. I guess that most of the, the German judges and courts will not be very happy about that result, but it doesn't help them. Now they have to look for sources where they find the uh, law sources, the civil code or whatever they have to have regulation for accidents and law of torts over there and apply that in Germany. Okay, and so the, the intermediate result without looking at the renvoi or the order public would be we will have to apply the rules of Thailand in that case. Okay, good. If you're still struggling with one or the other step, take a rest, go back, look at the video again and try to follow that. Um, I don't think it's uh, that you have a slight chance of understanding what I'm talking about if you don't read the laws and the rules closely. So get your PDF copies of these laws, read them closely, try to follow to what I said. And then if you say, okay, got the message, Mr. Banga, let's move on. You come back to that slide and we move on. Okay, good. So moving on means we go to case number two. Case number two, well, more or less unfortunately, uh, is a very common case in uh, real life and in international business. One of your business partners goes into insolvency or bankruptcy or whatever the names for that uh, type of procedure is. So these persons, they don't, they're not able to pay anymore. And person means it could be a natural person, a human being, or it could be a legal person, a company or something like that, but they cannot pay their bills anymore. Though in most states worldwide, there is an official and a uh, state procedure, a public law procedure, and an insolvency agent takes over and tries to pay whatever is possible to pay. Usually you get a quote, a quota, so uh, the average quota in Germany is not very high if you're really just a normal uh, creditor in, a, in an insolvency case. You might prepare yourself to get something between two, four, five. Sometimes if you're really lucky, 10% of what you actually would have to get. So oof, tough luck. Uh, because of that, internationally and nationally, um, suppliers will have what they call a title of retention clause in their contracts, meaning as long as the goods you have delivered are not paid, um, the goods are yours. And even the insolvency agent would have to give them back. So in our case, that's it. So there is, has already been a delivery. Now the, the buyer, he went into bankruptcy and the guy in the United States says, oh, poof, I want my money back and I'm gonna sue the guy in Stuttgart. Okay, again, the first question would be, how do we qualify that? Now, try to think about that yourself. Use your creativity, maybe go back and look at the other slides. And let's follow the, the qualification, um, the sequence or the claims. The first would be contractual claims. Yes, uh, the supplier has a contractual claim on payment. But as I already told you, he might prepare to get something between 5 and 10%. And 10% means pretty lucky guy, gets a lot of money compared to the average quote you would get. Um, so the second would be, um, if I don't get the money, I'd like the goods back. Okay, And this is what he wants. And so if you want the goods back, uh, that's a question of rights in REM. That means I have some kind of absolute right on a thing, the buffers or the compressors or the furniture or the computers, whatever. So that's title of retention. As long as it's not paid, it's mine. I can't get it back, even from the insolvency agent. And that's what that guy is up to. He says, ooh, that would be a good idea. So it actually, it's still a damage because usually when you get the goods back, they are not as valuable, as good as they were when you delivered them. 
but it's better than to get just 10% or, well, 5% of what you actually expected to be there. All right, good. So we again look at the qualification over here. We say it's, uh, oops, where are we? Oh, I could have shown you that one. Um, and now the, the next thing is, so this is what I was already talking about. I'm sorry, so I don't know my own slides. So next time it's gonna be better. Um, so we have a property rights question, which is to be qualified as rights in REM. And if you look at that, uh, the German rules for that, so that makes sense to go back to this one. What you can see over here is that claims based on rights in REM, that's uh, the only national law from international private law, a conflict of laws, which is left over. All the rest is Rome and CISG, Rome 2, 2, 2, and stuff like that. And that's the only one. The European Union is about to prepare a regulation for rights in REM as well. Um, but they have been doing that for, I'm afraid, for a couple of decades already. So I don't know when they will be ready especially since the world right now, this video is from 2020, has different problems. One of them is called Corona. We have a Corona pandemic going on. So the nations are, and the governments are struggling with that. And the second thing is for the European Union, especially United Kingdom dropped out of the European Union. They're negotiating that. So I'm pretty afraid that they will not have a lot of time to take care of a Rome 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, whatever, um, dealing with the property rights in international private law. Well, but that's it. So we come back to what I already showed you, your rights in REM. We pick the, the first German, the only leftover German article, which is relevant for that. And that's a, a pretty easy one to be applied. Uh, it's even easier than the one about law of torts. It's article 43 of the German Introductory Act of the Civil Code. It's uh, EGBGB, Einführungsgesetz zum Bürgerlichen Gesetzbuch. And you will have to have the same thing as with Article 4 in the Rome 2. You have to have a look at it. So uh, let's have a look at it. And here it is. Uh, again, that's the principle, the general rule. And there might be different regulations, different situations. They're not always like that, but that's the general rule. And I would guess that it is uh, applicable in more, by far more than two thirds of the cases um, which deal with rights and REM, okay? So, interests in property are governed by the law of the country in which the property is situated. That's a pretty realistic approach to questions on rights and REM, because if the goods are in Germany, um, the only authorities you can ask to get your goods and your property back are German authorities because it's on German territory. So it makes sense to use the German laws for that. Otherwise, the German state might refuse to do that. The same thing with the United States. If the things are in the United States, uh, it's very funny to have a German judgment, but <laughs> you don't know whether they're accepted over there. And even some of our neighbors over here, Switzerland, France, um, they deny some of our German regulations on the transfer of property, especially when it comes to security rights. And they say, no, we don't accept that. That's kind of strange what you're doing over there in Germany. So you better refer to the place where the goods are. So you can be sure if you apply these rules, that country will then afterwards, if you're successful with your lawsuit, that country will help you with the state authorities and the state institutions to enforce the judgment, you really get your, so you really get your goods or you're told, you know, you don't get it. So you don't get it. Okay, that's, uh, that's tragic, but you save money for the court procedures. That's nice as well. At least it's uh, tightening down or tightening down, cutting down the, the costs and the expenses. Good. Now, then let's have a look at it, at the case again, okay? We are dealing with property rights in that case. It's rights in REM to be qualified. We have a regulation for that, which is the German Article 43 of the Introductory Act to the Civil Code. And since these goods, tough luck for the United States supplier, are in Germany, the German laws will be applied. So most likely, they, he'll get them back, pretty sure. 
but even though he should get them back, uh, the supplier in the United States might not that might not be that happy if it's German laws. Otherwise, with the German judge and the German courts, oh, applying our own laws, that's nice. We prefer to do that, and because they know how to do that, they're trained on that since law school, and uh, so they will do that. It's a nice thing. Okay, good. Same thing as with the first case. Please have a close look at that. Go back and forth, read it, try to understand it. Please read all the articles closely. And then if you think, got the message, Mr. Bank, uh, really know what's going on, then you move on with the next slide and the next information I'm going to give you now. Because now, in a lot of cases, let it be the CISG as in our other presentations, let it be um, the laws of Germany or Thailand in our two example cases. Once we are that far, it's unfortunately not the end of international private law or conflict of laws, because there are two more. Actually, to be honest, it's more than two. Okay. But I refer to these. These are the major informations you would need. There's a little more fuzz and uh, academic discussion about other aspects of that. But let's stick with these two. Um, there are more steps and there are more prerequisites to be uh, checked. The first of which is, um, does that case lead us to the problem which is called renvoi? And I promised you, I would wanted to tell you why most of these expressions in uh, international private law and conflict of laws are French. Um, international trade and international traveling started in the late uh, 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And in those days, the language of diplomacy was not English or German, it was French. So when all of these legal problems came up because of more international trade, people moving from one state to the other, marrying people with their different nationality and things like that, um, that was a, a diplomatic question and they would use the French language and that sticked to the uh, international private law. And when you look at the Rome 2 and Rome 1 regulation and even in the uh, Anglo-American world, they call it renvoi. Renvoi doesn't actually mean anything else but going back and forth, something like that. Um, there are two regulations or two articles which do represent that. and. We're going to have a look at that so I can explain what that is. So that is the German general rule in Article 4. If ref referral is made to the law of another country, the private international law of that country shall also be applied. Okay? So that is a very good example we have. Um, that is, if you have different approaches to how to figure out which laws can be applied. In the United States and in the Anglo-American system, in a lot of cases, the laws which have to be applied on a case are dependent upon the domicile of the people involved. Okay, that is pretty typical, especially for the United States, because a lot of immigrants were there. And they had an interest to integrate them in their own law systems as fast as possible because these people from Poland and Italy and Germany and Ireland and China, wherever they came from, had to be integrated into the culture. The European states are referring to the nationality. Okay, that's your passport. You look in your passport, you know which nationality you have. And no one can easily... Um, uh, find an example. If we have a young uh, United States guy coming from Michigan, uh, let, let's call him Ken. And Ken went to Germany for uh, his final degrees and he decided so nice over here in Germany, he's 70 years out, 17 years now. And he, he, it's so nice for him over here. He said, I'm going to stay here. My, my domicile is going to be over here and his parents agree and all that. So He's going to be staying in Germany and uh, he's pretty sure forever. That's a nice 
country over here, and maybe he's a nice landscape, I don't know. Now that Ken, he, he wants to study and he has to move to another place, and he would like to rent a flat because he has to live in another place. Uh, he has to move from Frankfurt, let's say, to, to Munich. And um, in Munich, they say, uh, young man, um, you don't have the capacity for a rental contract because you're 17 only. And in Germany, you have to be 18 for that, which is correct. Now, maybe a lawsuit would come up and then say, well, how could we do that? And then the court would have to say the question whether our smart student can, uh, has capacity for a rental contract or not, is dependent on the laws of the country he is a member of, he has the nationality of, so it's United States. and. In the United States, Michigan. So we would look at the United States, Michigan laws, and would find out whew, people living in Michigan and born in Michigan, they get a partly capacity to buy a car, to rent a flat um, when they're 16. But if we really call up the Michigan laws, as it says down there, the private international law of that country shall also be applied. Uh, Michigan rules say, we got to refer to the domicile. And the domicile now is in Germany. And German capacity rules say 18. And Germany would again bring it back to the United States. Germany, United States, United States, Germany, and would go back and forth, batting and forth. And this is why we have a rule like that, saying we got to split it up at a certain point. Most states will wide do it the way that they say, so we use our own laws. Um, that can be a renvoi, meaning there's only some kind of mirroring of two international law systems. That can be, and this is why it's called a circle or circuit in, in French. It can go around from Germany to the United States, to Canada, to Italy, to Germany, and then it goes like that, or whatever. So there are pretty much uh, possibilities that the case is transferred on. So once you know what is applicable, you're not really made, it's not really done, uh, because you've got to figure out, uh, is the case sent on, or does the other law system actually accept that choice of the first law system? Okay, well, a little different in Rome 1. There is an exclusion of Rome 1, because, as you might remember, Article 3 of Rome 1, that is the European regulation about contractual claims and contracts, uh, Rome 1, Article 3 says, the people, the buyer and the seller, may choose the law system they would like to be applied. Okay, And if they are allowed to choose the law system, it would be a kind of ridiculous to first tell the people, choose whatever you want, then you choose the laws of France, excluding the CISG, and then we say, well, let's see whether France likes it, and we send them on. It's a choice, and if they want a choice, if they have the freedom to choose, we have to accept that. And that basically is the content of Article 20 of the Rome 1 regulation. The application of the law of any country specified by this regulation means the application of the rules of law enforced in that country other, okay, not the ones, other than it rules of private international law. So if we once determined via the Rome 1 regulation or the CISG, which laws will be applied on a contract, a sales contract, a rental contract, a service contract, a tax consultancy contract, or whatever, then these laws will be applied. We don't send them on and on and on and on and have the problems I just showed you with the, the renvoi. Okay? Same thing as before. If you think you got it, fine. If you say, no, not really, Mr. Banker, go back a little, have a close look at what I just tried to tell you. Try to follow these laws, look at them, read them closely. And then when you say, okay, I'm done, we can go on to the last part. Um, it, it, it's the last part. 
that is ordre public. It's again French, you know why already. You'll find these laws, the meaning of that, in almost every national, international law source worldwide. Um, and the idea is of that, that no court can be forced, even though they have to apply a foreign law system, to do things which would be contrary, completely contrary to their culture or even human rights or something like that. Okay, so Article 6 of the Introductory Act to the German Civil Code and Article 21, it's just an example, you'll find it everywhere, okay? They have about the same content. A provision of the law of another country shall not be applied where its application would lead to a result. That, that's one of the major points, the, the main point actually to a result which is manifestly incompatible with the fundamental principles of German law, in particular inapplicability and choose if its application would be incompatible with civil rights. Okay, that's the human rights, it's the civil rights. The, about the same in, in, in Rome 1, the application of a provision of the law of any country specified by this regulation may be refused only if such application is manifestly incompatible with the public policy of the forum. Forum, it's just the old Latin word for the court, where the court is situated. Now, I want to point out one thing. Um, read these articles closely. They, they're both talking about the result of the application of uh, foreign law. So we do not, we do not judge the law as such, the foreign law. There might have pretty good reasons for these laws elsewhere and not good reasons for them in Germany. And a very, well, very good international example would be when we look at the rules about divorce of a marriage. In some religious law systems, a divorce can only be done by some kind of a religious authority. Whereas in the Western world, Germany, United States, and most of these, uh, what we call Western states, a divorce can only be made by a court or some kind of public state-run administrative institution. The rules about a divorce in a religious law system may seem strange for us to go to a priest or to go even on the marketplace and follow specific procedures. But if the result of these procedures has the same content, that doesn't mean the same, exactly the same quotes of money to be paid or something like that, but it's about the same fair balance of duties, rights and obligations then it would accept it because it's, it's the, the procedure is the other country's procedure. And for the people living in a religious uh, law system and they really uh, believe in the religion of their country, it is strange if you have to go to court for divorce because they say, well, pff, uh, I divorced, that, that's nothing for a court, that's God's uh, sake. And then they, he or she actually gave us the, the rules and now you tell me I go to a court, it's just a human being. We cannot uh, cut up these tight bands that's got to be done by a religious, a religious authority, okay? So what you will have to look at is not what they do over there, but only the result, and if the result is violating civil rights and fundamental rights system, then we can talk about applying the order public, which always is kind of dangerous. It is dangerous because if you cut out specific rules because you say they're incompatible with our civil rights system, then you have a vacuum. What shall we apply instead? If every country just takes his own rules, then it's pretty arrogant say, okay, I, I cut that out, so I take my own. So in that case, we would have to look for some kind of other possibility to find a proper rule, meaning a useful rule for that legal question, um, instead of the one we refer to apply because of the result of it in that case, okay?
Good. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think even though it's just uh, a little more than half an hour I've been talking to you, that's pretty hot stuff you, you're just working with. I would advise you to watch it twice or three times, then look all the regulation up, try to follow it, and then make up your own mind. Then you go on research on the internet, on the public libraries, on the university libraries you have to access, you have access to, and see what you find with these keywords such as renvoi, qualification and in international private law, or order public. That's it for today. There is more to come. And hopefully I made it to get the links below our little contribution over here. Then you can click on those and get the information some of you might already have seen before. Thanks for listening today again. Since 2020 was the year of Corona, <laughs> all the best and stay healthy. And I really hope to see you with the next episode in a couple of uh, weeks. See you then. All the best. Stay healthy and bye-bye.